affected my life very directly, dramatically in the beginning. Not knowing what disability means, not knowing what the future holds. Am I going to spend the rest of my life like this? It was shocking and it was scary for me. Mazen Arebi is one of many people with disabilities who come to Canada from different lands and diverse cultures. Their lives have followed many paths that often led to a dead end. But now many, like Mazen, are weaving their way through a complex and emotional journey. Many more, though not all, are finding success. I live in uh, Baghdad from 1978 till the year I came. And before that, I lived in Basra, the city that I was born in. I was 10 years old here. When I was able-bodied, it was just a normal life. This is me and my best friend, Khaled, um, in Baghdad. I was working as an auto mechanic, and I joined the military in November 85. Until 1986, uh, September 1986, that's where I got uh, to be in a wheelchair. Prior to this, Mazen had not known anyone with a disability in Iraq a country where he says they are often hidden away. You don't see them. You don't see on the street somebody, you know, wheeling a, a manual wheelchair, or uh, you don't see transportation, or you don't see them in events. You don't see them there. Because, again, society, it's cultural issues. Uh, people look at disabled people like they are nobody. They don't exist. I became disabled in, uh, in September 1986. That was in Baghdad. I was 22 at that time. I remember uh, that day very good because it's still in my mind. I still remember it. It's like happening now. It was uh, the 13th of September and it was a Saturday. And I remember I went to the hospital with my dad, walking. Within 36 hours, I was uh, completely paralyzed. Eventually, Mazen was diagnosed with polio. My expectation over there, uh, it was very dark. There is nothing for me to do. There was no transportation, no wheelchair, electric wheelchair. Our home wasn't accessible. Because, as in many other countries, there was no support network in Iraq, Mazen's family, especially his mother, Sharuk, had to take on that role. His life lies like a prisoner. He's in a prisoner. He couldn't go outside. On top of that, feeling the guilt, feeling a burden on my family, uh, it was affecting me more. I remember certain days when my mother uh, go to the kitchen and cry there and try not to make me hear her. She just go and cry and, you know, asking these questions, why my son, why, what happened to Hassan? I felt if I'm going to stay here more longer, I will 
just explode or uh, commit suicide or something because it was, again, very dark for me. The family applied to leave Iraq in 1986. They were turned down because of the war with Iran. They applied again in 1987 and were turned down again. And they told me, uh, we not allow you to go outside. When the war finished, you can't take your son. Permission was finally granted in 1988. The process took about a year to leave the country. So in 89, I, uh, I managed to leave Iraq and arrive here in Canada. The day that uh, I got the Canadian visa and I got the permission to leave, it was the happiest day in my life. The government, uh, they say, OK, you can't take your son. I took this, all these uh, papers. Uh, my husband took it to the embassy. And they said, OK. In three days, they gave me the visa. The time that Mazen spent as a person with a disability in Iraq weighed heavily on him. Like those in other parts of the world where there may be a lack of opportunity, he became isolated and totally dependent on his family, a condition or state of mind that he describes as a kind of hell. My priority was to leave that hell, if I may say, uh, and find another chance, another opportunity. When I arrived here, I was very impressed. Every day that goes by, I'm impressed in everything from the transportation that's available. I, the first time I see wheel trans bus, and I'm looking at the bus, and it's uh, deploying a ramp, which is something I've never seen before. Yusuf, you like flowers? Yes. yes. You're going to be a sensitive guy, I know. Rabia Kether, who is blind, is an active board member of ERDCO an organization for people with disabilities who come from different lands and ethnic backgrounds. People with disabilities, when they first arrive in Canada, they're overwhelmed by the uh, supports available, by the services available, by the acceptance of society in, in terms of their disability. And once they attempt to access services, Talk about the papers now. they start feeling a lot of the systemic barriers that that are a part of our system. I had the language barrier. My English wasn't good. I have no knowledge what's available for me. And every time we used to find out some kind of services, I will have a setback by not being eligible for these services. Because when I came to Canada, I was uh, on a visitor's visa. It's the family did contact occupational and physiotherapists, including Lynn Tintsey. She was helpful, but they had to pay directly for her services. There was no funding for us as well for you, because you were here as a visitor, so you had to pay for anything and everything that had to be done. And it was very expensive. And um, in a few months, I ran out of the money that I brought with me, and then I start to be a burden on my two brothers. Something behind behind me is telling me, you know, it's time to move on, move out of the family and, you know, let them live their life and I start to live my own life. But it, it was difficult because not knowing how and where and how to get there. And when I walked into that apartment and saw you there and realized, like, here's a young man who is doing nothing but basically lying on a bed or being placed in a chair. There had to be more. There had to be more available to you which you didn't have when you were back in Iraq. Those things weren't available. People are working hard to try to build some of those linkages or networks. However, there isn't a one-stop shop where you can learn the system or the uh, do's and don'ts of how to go about accessing the services that they may require. Usually, it's, uh, they're lucky if they link up with someone who has the same experiences as them and uh, learn through someone else's experiences, or it's, it's simply learning by default or by chance. 
we visited and tried to cover a whole bunch of territory, information-wise and assistive devices information. During a visit by Lynn, Mazin discovered that he wasn't using the right wheelchair for his needs. Well, I brought with me uh, a manual wheelchair and, uh, from Iraq. And that manual wheelchair, I cannot wheel it myself because I have one hand working and the other hand is not. So I used to go on circles. So um, I didn't know that there is an electric wheelchair exists until the uh, occupational therapist uh, mentioned that, uh, why don't you look into uh, electric chairs? But she mentioned that they are expensive. That was like about around $10,000. One day I woke up and there is an uh, electric chair sitting there for me wrapped in a nice uh, gift wrap. And they said, Merry Christmas, that's your Christmas gift. And I was very happy. First, because uh, I finally got something to be independent and drive myself. And second, knowing that uh, th the each brother and each cousin pitched in a hundred dollars. They bought an electric chair for him that he was one. That's the first thing. Oh, thanks God, when he, he can go to the park, he can go walk, he can by himself. For me, that chair, it was, it was a Cadillac for me. With a little ingenuity and the application of his experience as a mechanic, Mazin improved further on his newfound mode of transportation. I went to West Park Hospital and I noticed in the storage room that they have, um, they have very old chairs and, you know, the, it's collecting dust sitting in that storage room. And with the help of my uh, brother and father, both are mechanical engineers, so I took the motors, the good motors of the other chair and the batteries, and I put them in my chair. And they uh, helped me to put together a, g a really good chair that I can use that goes fast, more comfortable, and uh, it was serving the purpose at that time. So it was very good to feel that, uh, you know, we can get something out of nothing. Yeah. Mazin and his family were here on a visitor's visa. Now they were looking for more permanent status. Canada's immigration policy is severely restrictive for people with disabilities. The Immigration Act has medical guidelines that make it very difficult for them to become landed immigrants and permanent residents. The positives that the individual can bring to the country are not granted enough points on, on, our, on our scale, so to speak as to the negatives that they may be bringing in or, or have the potential to bring in in terms of the medical needs. So a lawyer specializing in immigration matters presented two options to the family. They could claim refugee status or Mazin's two brothers could become sponsors. They would then take on full responsibility for all his expenses. According to current rules, a responsibility that could last 10 years. At that time, the Iraq, uh, the Gulf War had started in 1990. They decided to stay in Canada when the situation got worse back home. They applied in early 91, and they would have to wait a year for a decision. In the meantime, Mazin worked on improving his English. I did study English back home, but uh, there is lack of practice. Uh, so. I start to take courses in ESL courses, uh, English as a second language. Most people with disabilities from other cultures place a high priority on upgrading their English. They need to learn English as quickly as possible when arriving to Canada. Through whatever form, whether that's through watching as much TV as you can. Okay. With us being included in this event, is one step and, and uh, talking to people as often as you can that are that are around you neighbors friends family members in english mm -hmm. 
one day I was, um, I wanted my curtains to be open, but I don't know the word curtains. So I'm pointing to the window for the attendant. I said, could you please open those things that cover the window? So he said, oh, OK, you mean curtains. I said, OK, so now I know that they, they called curtains. And uh, so every day I ask the attendant, would you mind opening the curtains? One day I was shaving in the washroom. And he said, do you want me to open your blinds? And I, you know, uh, rinsing my razor, can't hear very well. I said, what is he talking about? So I said, no, I did not hear what he exactly said, blinds. I don't know what blinds mean. So uh, when I came from the shower and I said, would you mind opening the curtains? He looked at me. He said, well, I asked you if you want your blinds to be open. And I said, what's blinds? He said, curtains. <laughs> So now I learned that curtains, there's two names for it, blinds and, uh, and curtains. And uh, the other word is uh, drapes. So here we go. There's uh, my uh, English uh, lesson. There is curtains, there is drapes, and there is blinds. This is the things that I was looking for to, clo to cover the window, basically. Yeah. While Mazen was busy refining his knowledge of the English language, the family's immigration application was being reviewed. A decision was to be made in April 1992. I felt really scared and not knowing if I'm going to be accepted or not, because for me it was life and death kind of issue. If I get accepted, I'm fine. I'm living again. I can continue my new journey, my new life where if I get turned down, then uh, it will be more scary. Sure enough, our application was reviewed, and they accepted it. And it was a huge relief for us, for me and my family. When I first came to Canada, as I mentioned, I lived with my two brothers and my mother. And we lived in non-accessible apartment. And that, I faced a lot of difficulties. Sometimes they want to go out and uh, with their friends. And I will say, no, you can't go today because uh, I, I need to go to the washroom or something, and then they have to stay and wait for me until I'm finished and back again on my chair. I feel like I was still a burden on them, and, and that's, in a way, encouraged me to, to leave. Uh, not because I don't love the family or anything, it's just to ease that guilt. Hello. Hi, Mazin. Good morning. It's great to see you. Same here. Yeah. I met uh, a person named Hazel Self, and she was the greatest person that I met because she introduced me to uh, some of the services that's available uh, in, in Toronto. And one of them, the major one for me, it was the GAGE, GAGE Transitional Living Center. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> what they do is they live there for a while, for as long as they require, learn the uh, life skills, uh, learn how to live independently. For you, of course, your family were extra afraid of how it was going to work yeah, for you. So. so your poor mom, what she was going through at that time. Me and my mother uh, refused the idea of uh, leaving my home. Uh, my mother. Uh, her side of the story was she was scared that her son will not get the proper attention. She think that she's the only one who can offer the help and the attention uh, from the bottom of her heart without asking something in return. No, by himself, if I go with him, it's okay. They said, no, you, uh, that's a place special for uh, people to depend to themselves. At the same time, 
there were my brother, uh, which is my older brother, and he uh, he talked to my mom saying, by keeping Mazen here and making him depend on you completely, it's not right. Um, because sooner or later, one day you are going to get sick or you will not be able to care for him. And then he's stuck. I believe that everyone who tries, uh, especially Mazen, is very determined. Uh, his perseverance is, is amazing. So yeah. I, uh, I was very sure that he's going to make it. Do you remember your encouraging words and your explanation? And I remember I have problem with the language, so you were, you know, uh, saying things slowly, so for me Keep it to sim understand. Keeping it simple. It's a big step for anybody. Right. So I find it's so important to reassure the person that, yes, it's possible. Yes. Because fear can hold somebody back. And that's yes. such a shame if someone doesn't dip their toe in the water, so to speak. Yes. They called it life skills courses. Uh, some of them is how to direct your own care, okay. Bring my uh, how up. to deal with an attendant. Thank you. I'll get my legs up. Thank you. I didn't expect that attendants can listen to me and yes. listen to what I want and the way I want things to be done. And they will do it, actually. They will be mm. kind of my arms and legs. Uh, that's how I felt at that time. It was amazing. It's a great system. It really works well. And it provides that support for people with high level of physical disability, such as us, to live on our own in the community. And that's so liberating. It was uh, very useful for me to take these courses and to live at the gauge, actually. Uh, and then the good thing is, after one week, only one week, staying mm -hmm. at the gauge, I, I felt, yes, I can do it. Okay. Yeah. So basically then, you, you have then a new relationship with your family, or it's like a normal relationship. Yes, yes. And they cease to be your caregiver. Uh, yeah. Good, eh? <laughs> I took a deep sigh and my mother is going to be okay uh, and that he's going to be okay by learning things by himself. I saw far a few years ahead I can see Mazen you know depending on himself. My brother was right and uh, I was mad at him in the beginning because in my mind like how dare you want me to leave you guys like uh, but i did not know that he's doing that for my own sake until now i think him i thank him very much uh, for have being uh, brave enough to say it and to encourage me and to do it and make that move and i did but it's interesting that you had those two transitions to make the one sort of away from your culture in a sense plus the one into independent living. So you had like a double whammy to cope with. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that a lot before. Ah, oh, what a beautiful day. I used to sit here and think about life and see if I'm gonna be able to make it or not. Yeah, I remember when I used to come here and a lot of thoughts came to my mind. Sometimes negative, sometimes positive. I, in here, I remember I planned my future. I used to think, what's the, what's the next step? I moved to my apartment. August 29, 92. My, my brothers helped me to move my stuff, and uh, the place was accessible, and I'm, I've been living since. Mazen's next step was to find a job. 
he knew that he had to redirect his sights from his previous occupation towards another career path. When I left Iraq, I had worked as an auto mechanic, but now I had to think of something else to do. One day, I saw my brother Ross working on a computer and decided that might be something for me. And I was working with AutoCAD uh, that day. And I showed him a few things and said, and he was amazed and, he, and I saw his excitement and he was comprehending everything I told him. And I told him, listen, you learn this, you go outside and make money. He said, uh, me, work? I said, oh, don't worry, you'll see. And then I took courses. I took introduction to computers and word perfect. Um, it's a typing, it's a processing uh, software. And uh, I, c I start to like computers and then my brother introduced me to drafting uh, by computer using AutoCAD. Then in 91 and 92, he went to Toronto's Central Technical School where he studied drafting. At the time, he had to go through the back entrance, the only one that was accessible. In two years' time, he learned AutoCAD and he got a, a job in the Hugh McMillan Center. Yeah. Uh, he was designing stuff. Mazen. Yeah. He started a summer job in the mechanical design department at the Hugh McMillan Rehabilitation Center. His initial four-month contract was extended to a total of 10 months. I managed to get a job and I was paying my own rent and I was paying my own expenses. And it's a good feeling that I was uh, living independently and not needing uh, anybody else and not needing to feel that I'm still a burden on uh, my parents or my or social services or other uh, government programs. I'm contributing to society as everybody else. I am a taxpayer and uh, it's a good feeling to feel that I am independent. I felt I needed more education uh, when I was at the end of the uh, my contract at the Hugh McMillan Rehabilitation Center. I, uh, after my job, I felt I, I was the only one without higher education at the center at that time. So I thought maybe it's a good opportunity for me to go and go back to school and upgrade myself. He had completed high school in Iraq where he'd also acquired a college diploma in his chosen profession as an auto mechanic. Many of the degrees earned in other countries are not acknowledged as equivalent uh, from most minority countries and, or, or from countries of uh, third world countries. Most of the uh, academic criterion is, is not equal to Canadian standards. When I arrived in Canada, um, I have to redo everything again. When I showed them my uh, high school certificate, and my two-year college diploma. They gave me only 26 credits. I needed four credits to get, uh, to get total of 30 credits. So the first thing I start uh, with grade nine at uh, Bigfoot Center, and then coming here to the City Adult Learning Center, taking grade 10, 11, and 12, English and math. It's good to have uh, a Canadian certificate, high school certificate, but uh, it took me a long time. I wanted to try computers, and there was a good course that offered here at the City Adult Learning Center, uh, introduction to computer and eventually computer programming. However, the course was offered in a non-accessible class. It was uh, in a lab, and the labs, uh, it, it was underground, and uh, to get there, you need to go by stairs. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to take that. 
So I lost a good opportunity for me. This was not the only barrier that Mazin encountered. Like most people with disabilities from other cultures, he has had to work his way around many obstacles. And when he compared his experiences with others, he realized there was a lot of common ground. That would prompt him to co-found an organization that would tackle these social barriers, many of which have cultural origins. Some of the key barriers are racial discrimination, any form of discrimination on the basis of race, religion, culture, gender, age, uh, and of course combined with the disability become uh, doubly so or, 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 or triple barriers or multiple barriers in fact. I faced uh, some kind of discrimination I call it uh, because some people treat me bad uh, because I'm, I was from Iraq and that's